And when we look at learning outcome two, here we are looking at primarily studying, um, um, you know, we are looking at primarily studying um, the importance of human resource planning within the organization, how human resources are, um, you know, planned in terms of if you are an HR manager. Give me one second. So, So here what we are looking at is primarily understanding the process of how planning is done in any other department uh, an example um, very briefly if we look at say for example um, engineering as a department what we do get to see is that if a new product is being created the engineering department would put some sort of a planning thought process in place at least uh, you know the product design the product uh, key features some research and you know inputs from customers uh, and you know competition is looked at and once that document is ready what they do is then create a prototype as stage that prototype goes into you know development in terms of uh, creating um, you know an actual product and once the product is tested and it meets all the requirements what you will see is that um, you know the um, at some stage the uh, you know the uh, engineering department will then seek an approval to put it into mass production. So similarly, in the case of human resources, when we look at human resources in general, you will see that um, there is a lot of planning which is required from an HR's perspective, and that planning primarily is required when they look at either recruitment, when they look at selection, when they look at you know appraisals, when they look at you know creating a new job vacancy or a role. And that is the whole process of planning that we will understand in the uh, you know, learning outcome too. We will also understand regarding planning, um, what are the key areas which HR looks at and how this management of planning can be associated with a model called soft and hard HRM. Now this was an approach which was introduced a number of years back and this approach is uh, you know, uh, applied by different organizations, um, you know, in terms of managing, uh, you know, HR um, or resources within the organization. And this particular model, uh, you know, and when we look at the hard and soft approaches was uh, something which was created by, you know, one of the authors uh, which did research in terms of, you know, um, how these approaches can actually be, um, you know, applied to manage resources within an organization. Now, guest and story were the ones which basically came up with this idea of soft and hard models of HRM. And in their view, you know, obviously, uh, there was a key distinction that we will also discuss, which is required to understand, uh, you know, the planning function, the, you know, the planning for function in terms of the soft approach and the hard approach. This also, before I get into actually, you know, the, the learn, discussion of the learning outcome, this is just more of a bit of a background that is required for us to understand that how um, you know the concept of human resources planning has come into play. And there are lots of studies which have happened in the past few decades, uh, which is specifically the theory X and Y, uh, which concentrated on you know studying uh, the various approaches and views of how human nature and managerial control strategies actually work within the organization. So here, um, you know, the idea when they came up with uh, the guest, guest and story were the two, you know, scholars which did that study. And when they came up with this idea of, uh, you know, soft and hard approach of human resources management, they based their, uh, you know, findings on the uh, on, on, on studies which were primarily done. Uh, when they found that, you know, um, a certain type of approach, a hard HRM approach works in a particular situation and a soft approach works in a sim uh, different situation. And they then came across with certain key features and parameters which actually defined this particular approach in terms of, uh, you know, our understanding. So we will discuss about this in a bit more detail and understand both these approaches, which is primarily important and one of the key concepts, uh, you know, uh, involved in uh, when we look at human resources planning. Now, um, if I get into, you know, individual, um, um, you know, the uh, tasks within this, what we want to be able to do is basically understand uh, what are the key areas uh, of HR 
from a point of view of organizational context. So as we discussed last time, there is, um, you know, the human resources environment is affected by internal as well as external factors within the organization. So when we look at the internal factors, internal factors could be from within the company or the organization and this, this could, these could essentially be other departments are affecting the operational activity of HR. So it could be say uh, the marketing department, the sales, the uh, you know accounting and finance administration departments. The external environment which affects, we discussed last time was using a you know graphical picture, if you remember the, the Pentagon uh, kind of a shape, which basically meant the external would be legislation, government uh, you know policy. Uh, it could be compliance, which the HR departments to look at for uh, say for example, employment related laws, and, and you know, dealing with the unions and stuff, those would be the factors which affect, you know, the planning on the uh, external side. Now, when we look at the context of, um, you know, HR, it is normally, uh, you know, described into two distinct forms. One is that you will see some organizations take a very soft approach to managing employees. And some organizations, they take a, a hard Task oriented based, uh, based or cost approach, you know, cost oriented based approach, uh, for managing resources. And that approach would be, you know, called as hard approach. So one of the key things that we need to understand, um, if you see the slides, which I'm going to put forward are going to be, to, uh, are going to be to understand the ways in which, you know, human resources planning is actually uh, seen within the organization. So these two approaches, they come into play, and this is where the research from Story and Wood, uh, which is what they did in 19, uh, the early 1990s, came into play from a point of view of, you know, um, understanding why these approaches, uh, and they came up with the idea of building these approaches because they felt that some organizations, because they're task-oriented, or some organizations which are uh, more, uh, you know, uh, uh, oriented in terms of concerning um, humans or people as an important resource within the organization, they took the soft approach. So let's look at these two approaches, uh, you know, and understand them in a bit more detail. Now, <clears throat> as we say the word hard, um, you know, it basically means that, you know, the employees are treated as a resource, as any other resource within the organization. So sometimes you will see that when companies undertake projects, or when they work on, uh, you know, uh, a systematic project, which is going to last as an activity for a few months or a few years to get the business into operation or, you know, to set up a new operation in a country uh, or, or a new branch office, for example, you will see that that kind of an approach taken by uh, the management seems to be a hard approach because what they see is that, okay, we will require a project manager, a few other people to set up the operations in that country. And once it is set, you know, that team will be or will be done away with. So here they treat, uh, you know, from a point of view of funding, from a point of view of costing, there is a clear link that you see, which is uh, linking into the corporate strategy of the company that we need to expand and open offices in five locations within this year. And for this, five teams will be created. Once the offices are opened or the branches are running, then obviously the teams working in that will be shuffled or they will be re-looked at um, either made redundant, you know, deployed elsewhere, or in some cases disbanded. That means that done with. The other thing that we look at in the hard approach is that the focus of uh, the HR and the department is primarily on on the basis of you know what is the business requirement. That means if the business needs ten people to be uh, you know make that making that project successful, they will look at ten. But if they see that after a point in time. Um, you know, the once the uh, operation is set into motion and the requirement is less, you know, you will look at some employees being fired or, you know, made redundant. So here the approach primarily is looking at the concept of uh, managing it from a point of view of a resource. Soft HRM, on the other hand, you know, will treat employees as an important resource for the business. They see it as a long term investment. And here they will treat them to be able to build uh, you know, staff strengths, skills, uh, you know, um, str you know, what do you call opportunities from a point of view of creating a competitive advantage. When I say competitive advantage, that would mean that they would see that, okay, if we hire 
somebody maybe to start that project that same person could head that project maybe after the initial operations have started so they look at not just the initial capability of having the employee um working as a project manager to start the look uh, you know office uh, or branch office in that location but the person to be able to manage that in the future going forward once the offices are open and here because of this approach you will see that the employees are treated with respect and obviously the organization takes into account you know their um, uh, requirements needs which are phased in terms of a plan that okay once this is done this end will be provided once this is achieved or uh, you know completed this will be provided so there is a reward mechanism in short which is put in place because if the work is done well and it is done quicker as against the timeline set then in that case there are appropriate reward mechanisms which the soft approach puts in place now having understood the approach let's look at um, briefly understanding what are the key features you will see in both the approaches so in the hard approach it is normally um, you know because i've given you an example of a project, the approach tends to be short term once the job is done they, you know the team might be disbanded the projects when they are done using the hard approach typically have minimal communication on a top to down process that means they will hire a person which knows exactly how the job needs to be done what decisions have to be made and once they are given that particular job you will see that there is very minimal communication is happening from management downwards because here the cost of hiring resources is quite high and what they will see is that these resources typically are um, you know they have a lot of experience to be able to deliver on those opportunities or on the project which they have been hired for and then the other thing that you will see is that here the pay is there uh, or they are paid enough to recruit and also uh, you know retain in some cases some staff wherein they feel that you know it is uh, on a minimal uh, wage basis um the other things that are important in this case is that you will see this kind of an approach um you know which primarily tends to happen uh, when organizations have you know uh, what do you call tall structures that means there are lots of the hierarchy within the structure and that hierarchy within the structure allows um, you know these kind of project teams to be created so their structure is more or less autocratic in terms of leadership style you will see that uh, you know the, uh, the autocratic leadership style basically means that the person at the top makes the decision and then that has to be followed through into the organization and in uh, you know of uh, empowerment and delegation because the person at the top has uh, has the authority to make the decisions and those are then cascaded down you will see that the hard approach typically tends to have this kind of leadership style built into the uh, organization which is created on the soft side um, you know which is going to be uh, more or less expected to be opposite here workforce planning or you know hiring of staff are done from a long term perspective or a strategic perspective that means they will see this as a asset and they will say okay in order to grow the business we will need to have so many people within the organization to drive it further there is a good communication as against minimal communication stronger communication because they want to be involved the management is seen to be involved in the business and you will see uh, you know in these kind of organizations generally the organizational structure is flat or or democratic leader style is basically followed that means the management at the top will be open to listening to suggestions and taking decisions in consensus in order to make the projects viable yeah. or you know um, in in that situation make it workable so these are the features which are attributed to the hard and soft approach of hrm and this is one of the key models uh, you know key studies which we have to look at when we understand human resources planning and sometimes we will see that organizations end up taking either of the approach and in some cases uh, you know both the approaches from time to time but it is normally dependent on the structure of the organization how big the organization is and you know in terms of what is the leadership style uh, within the organization now <clears throat> you might have a question is which approach is best is the hard approach better or the soft approach better in terms of working uh, you know within the organization now both sides this particular uh, you know um 
study which was done could not conclusively present that which approach is better even though there was a lot of research done a lot of studies done but you know this led to a question wherein they then asked that you know which model um, is better or better suited with regards to uh, you know the organization now depending on the situation sometimes you will see the hard model approach is better because it see it takes a most more result oriented approach and here the costs are also kept in mind because the hard approach marries the corporate strategy uh, into or uh, takes the corporate strategy into view when uh, such uh, approach is taken on the other hand because sometimes it does not um, you know pay attention to the needs and wants of the employee or the things required to make the business or achieve, make get the business or you know make the activities happen it tends to suffer from uh, you know low morale motivation wherein you normally see that in this kind of an approach because the employees are treated as as another resource in the organization and you will see the employees end up leaving uh, the organization because they feel that they are not cared for or they are not respected enough uh their their needs and wants are not respected enough or uh, you know cared for and they end up leaving the organization now in terms of soft approach you will see that generally um you know the soft approach tends to um you know work well with the organization because most millennial organizations that we look at you know organizations which are after uh, create after the dot com bubble so you look at the likes of facebook microsoft google uh you know you look at apple here they have a soft approach towards the employees because they treat employees as a very important asset within the organization they feel that without employees and without good people working in the organization the organization will not be able to achieve its goal and that is why it makes good uh, business sense for them to uh, you know kind of recruit the best employees possible and reward the performance of the employees in order to keep them motivated and loyal towards the organization sometimes you will see the soft approach tends to slack and then slacking uh, you know means that you will see sometimes the organization lays off a lot of employees makes makes lot of them redundant because it becomes difficult for the organization over a period in time to sustain the benefits which are provided to the employees of the workforce and that uh, tends to put a lot of pressure on the profitability or the bottom line of the company and that is where you will see the growing uh, problem of you know companies in the uk or in the developed countries where in the pension uh, you know pot in most large private public sector organizations are running in deficit are running in loss so most employers are uh, uh, you know expected to provide handsome pensions of 6 to 8% in some cases even up to 12% and these payments have not been kept up by organizations because of pressures of you know the employee workforce so you look at organizations like microsoft google apple which has you know thousands of employees but if the organization has a soft approach and does not keep up with the pensions what you do get to see is that at some stage um, there is there are redundancies which tend to happen within the organization and that then they tends to kind of achieve the balance of the hard approach where they are treated as resources but they say okay we don't need that much staff and they didn't have mass redundancies you know and that is what we got to see uh, in the last recession you know the last financial crisis in 2007 2008 so um it is important to understand these approaches and how as a hr manager sometimes you will use these approach uh, to you know make decisions and do planning of resources within the organization and uh, this gives you a perspective that you know um um to a certain extent a perspective to understand that how planning needs to be done now let's look at some of the steps of planning uh, you know briefly let's understand how planning is done now we are using this word planning again and again but what i want to do is understand how uh, planning is done now just to also reiterate soft and hard approach of hrm i'm going to send you a handout which you need to read because this is going to Uh, this is one of the important concepts and you need to understand this in a bit more detail so i'm going to send you a paper um which is primarily a research paper 
and that kind of summarizes this approach in about two or three pages for you to understand why this was done, why this study was done, and how this study over the years became one of the important models, uh, you know, when we study uh, human resources plan. There have been lots of studies which have been built on, and, uh, you know, further research has been done on the initial study done by Story and Guest. And then what we do get to see is that the soft model, you know, um, uh, which, which uh, softened the hard uh, HRM model that we see, uh, you know, has been put to test within many organizations. And this approach is predominantly seen uh, in the early 60s, 70s, you know, uh, industrialization because it started to happen. You saw them mostly in the engineering production companies, but as, um, you know, the companies have evolved, the businesses have evolved, what we've seen is that there is a conflict which has happened between the soft and hard models of HRM, and that is where no particular approach uh, is, uh, you know, single-handedly applicable within the organizations. So at some stage, HR managers, management end up taking the hard approach, and at some stage, you know, they end up taking the soft approach. And uh, this has been proven uh, by a number of studies which have happened after that in large companies like BT in the UK, Citibank in the US, uh, we look at Glaxo, uh, Hewlett Packard, for example. Uh, we look at banking sector, Lloyd's uh, Bank, and this is where they have said that you know there is no one particular approach which is conclusive to the fact that it is employed within the organization, but a combination of both, uh, depending on the situation, is utilized by the management and the HR uh, to kind of you know balance the objectives uh, with the finances within the organization. Now. Having understood this as a bit of a background, what we want to be able to do now is to understand what are the key stages involved in, you know, human resource planning. Now, a question to you, what do you think, if you put on the hat of an HR manager, you know, what do you think are the key things that you will put into planning um, uh, or, you know, you would put or take into consideration for doing planning? Any thoughts, any ideas? Any 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 ideas that you can put forward? Like in uh, what case uh, about what planning for the organization or what? In general, say for example, that's a good question again. But um, and I, if I have to step back, why do you think we will need to do planning uh, from a human resources perspective uh, in the organization? For company betterment and you know, for it to grow. That is correct. So one of the key things that you mentioned is that why do we plan in general is that when we are looking at growing, when we are looking at growth, expansion, we need to do some planning. And that could happen to look at what resources would be required and those resources would be converted into costs and costs will be converted into revenues. So planning in general is required to understand the process and where and how growth can be achieved. So that's a good point. And if you have to look at this generic thing from a point of view of planning for HR, what do you think that would be? Daniel? Any thoughts on this, Daniel? Sorry? Sorry. Any thoughts on this? Okay, no problem. So when we, if I just take this forward, what we do is when we look at human resources planning, that should actually be a link between human resource management and the overall strategic plan of the organization. So sometimes you will see that the companies make a strategic plan and that could be a strategic plan that is put into place when they look at the new financial year. And when that planning is done, there is a plan which is also put in place for HR. Like um, the CEO might say, uh, you know, the board might, uh, the board and the CEO might put a plan in place that we are going to look at uh, growing the company revenues, uh, you know, by 150% in the next five, five years. So this is a statement which the board has put forward as a wish list and they want to look at growing the company revenues 
by 150% in the next five years. Now, at some stage, this strategic objective, which is put forward by the board, is broken down into individual objectives for different departments. So how will this 150% growth come about? That means maybe the production team, the engineering teams will look at what new products have to be worked on, what are the products in the pipeline which they are introducing, how they will look at going to the market. The marketing will side to the side, uh, you know, marketing department will look at things in terms of how they can look at increased promotions. Can they look at expansion into other countries or geographies or cities for uh, getting customers? Um, you know, finance side of things would look at things. What could be the financial requirements which will come in from an organizational perspective? Uh, and they would consider sending out, uh, you know, a memo to different departments to say what could be the financial requirements in terms of budgeting for uh, achieving this growth. So they might ask for a marketing plan, the budget. They might go to engineering and production and say, okay, how many resources do you need? Do you need to hire more engineers? What is the plan on that side? Um, you know, uh, marketing, sales, administration, you know, other key departments will be asked about the costing and budgeting that they would need to increase operations and increase activity to achieve that growth. So similarly, HR at some stage will also be asked and they were, their overall plan will be dependent on the plan which came from other departments. So marketing would say, okay, in order to achieve that growth, we need to have this much promotions to be done. This is the budget that we require and these the number of people that we will require for, uh, for us to hire. So we might need somebody else to do this, somebody else to do this. Engineering would say, okay, because we're introducing a new product and a new project is coming underway, we need 50 programmers or you know 50 people to work on this and this is the overall cost required to hire those people or you know the plan so that plan when it comes to hr they will then look at developing a human resources plan for the next 5 years for the organization and that would basically mean that you know they would start a process of human resource planning and that will ensure that requirements of human resource in an organization at different levels and different departments are identified and appropriate plans are put in place to meet or satisfy those requirements. So if the engineering department says we'll hire 10 employees this year, 20 next year, 13 in year three, and 50 by year five, a total of 110 employees are being hired. So the HR has to put a plan in place to look at that many employees for recruitment and selection. And then they have to start that planning. So basically, if we look at understanding the process of human resource planning, one side of things would be if a new strategic objective is put in place by the management, they would start looking at planning for human or people as a resource within the organization. If it is to look at training the existing workforce to for them to acquire new skills, then the HR with the use of uh, appraisals which is done identify gap areas or areas in which the existing staff needs more training and then they would put those training related training and development related expenses or budgeted budgeting in place and that will be primarily reskilling the workforce for them to acquire new skills to meet the demands of the growth which the management is asked for and the third would be that they will need to put some plans in place which will look at managing maybe the requirement of these additional resources uh, in terms of you know um, uh, more recruitment or in terms of more training and development and then in order to effectively move the organization into that direction they would need to put some sort of a change management also in place that means at their end when they do the planning they have to look at phasing out this change across five years that okay if the organization strength in terms of employees was 200 this year, next year it increases to 250. They also have their own planning to be able to, you know, uh, handle that workload of employees. So when we look at human resources planning, this is a five or a six stage process. The first stage looks at determination of organizational purposes and objectives. And these are then done at the top management level. So Example which I put on the slide is if the organization is looking at increased turnover, then they also have to commensurate increase the number of employees who will help get that increased sales or turnover. 
So planning is marry the HR plan into the strategic organizational plan to achieve the objective. The second step would be to look at understanding, uh, when I say environmental scanning, this would mean that they want to identify competition, they want to identify within the uh, company internal and external, the number of, uh, say not the number, but the type of employees which have the skills to support growth or that strategic plan. So here, they have to look at skills evaluation, they have to look at you know gap analysis or basically areas after doing the appraisals to see what uh, areas the employees would need skills or training on and development on. And this is something which is called you know, environmental scanning. That means scanning the internal and external environment of the company to understand what skills or what areas, which are gap areas, will be required to you know, do training and development on. Now, the third step would be to understand after this scanning has been done to understand what is the gap. When I say gap, that means the shortage in terms of skills or the shortage in terms of manpower or resources required within each department to fulfill that growth objective. And that is called determining the gap. And that gap, which they identify, is then to be estimated in terms of some sort of budgeting to, uh, you know, kind of hire skilled employees who will be responsible for doing those jobs. And that then becomes the third step in terms of, you know, identification of, uh, you know, gap, and then the determination of how much is the gap to then recruit that employees into the organization. The next step would be to look at finding the people which have the right skills and experience to work within these roles. And then once they do that, before they start looking at these people, they have to internally design the job description, the person specification, compensation and benefits. And that is environmental scanning also comes, comes into place because you cannot expect somebody to come in and work at a particular role at a lower salary than what the competition is paying. Or if your pay and benefits are lower than what the competition is paying, you might not be able to attract the best talent to come in and work. So the fourth stage focuses on primarily understanding and creating descriptions for which the people will be hired. So things like job description, you know, roles and responsibilities, person specification, benefits, pay grade, <coughs> structure in which the person will come in and work, and then compensation uh, is decided. The next step, once you've decided this and you've got this in written, what they need to do is they need to execute the plan. That means you will see the HR department putting out Word, a job advert or uh, will start to meet with agencies to get internal external methods of recruitment sometimes they place requirements for vacancies internally internally within the company employees can you know apply from different department into a role uh, that they do seem interested in or they will hire recruitment agencies uh, put out an advert to hire these employees the fifth step primarily then means looking at starting to recruit and the final step would be once you've started and shortlisted a few people in terms of recruitment, you brought them in after selection in terms of interview and then stuff, you are then looking at putting them into place, they start working, and then at a certain point in time, you do evaluation or monitoring, which is nothing but appraisals to see if the new employees joining, have, which have joined, have started to perform against the job descriptions which have been set, and are they able to achieve the targets are they able to work towards the uh, you know goals which have been set and are they overall helping the organizational move towards that uh, you know growth plan of 150% growth so in the sense when you look at you know planning seems to be a five uh, step process and this five step process uh, starts off with aligning the hr uh, planning with the corporate strategy wherein uh, you know it is broken down to understand this strategy then needs to look at resourcing and resourcing then needs to identify the capabilities, the skills, and once it is identified how they will hire uh, the employees or the uh, human resource through recruitment and selection process and then completing the full circle will be to review uh, you know the performance of the employees to see if they are able to perform as per the objectives which have been set. So if I have to summarize, 
you know the points. First is sometimes what happens is uh, uh, I'll give you a tangent example. If I ask you to do your SWOT analysis, you know, of yourself, you identify your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threat. What do you think, and what do you think I'm asking you to do your SWOT analysis for? Why do you think we ask you to do your SWOT analysis? So that we know about ourselves, like what are our weaknesses, and like we analyze it. Absolutely. So Daniel, any thoughts from your end? Why do you do your SWOT analysis? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to assess yourself against maybe a colleague or a peer or a friend and see what are your strengths and weaknesses against you know somebody else's strengths and weaknesses. So the aim of doing a SWOT is primarily at an individual level to understand and assess your own skills, correct? Mm -hmm. After you've done the assessment, what you do is you you have to then put into something called, you know, you will start a planning that, okay, I have, uh, I, I say, once you identified, you identified, okay, these are my strengths, I'm very good at IT, I'm very good at this, but you know, I am weak on some of these things. So for example, I'm, I'm not too good with maybe uh, English. I'm not too good with, say, for example, public speaking. I'm just giving a general example. So here, what you then tend to do is you identify the areas which need improvement. Correct? After your assessment, you identify the areas wherein you're very good in. You don't need any improvement. You need to continue. But the areas in which you need a, a, you know improvement after the assessment has been done, that is where you start to make the plan. So if I say I'm not good at public speaking, then in that case, what you will do is you'll put some steps in place so that it will help you improve your public speaking. So steps could be that I will probably join a class, maybe participate in some debates, you know, look at, um, you know, simple thing could be talk aloud by standing in front of the mirror. And those are things which are you are, which you are putting in place because you understood the gaps. And in order to complete or cover those gaps, you are then identifying different techniques which will help cover those gaps. And those gaps, practices that you have to do to be able to speak correctly or, you know, in front of public, maybe have participation in debates. And those things will essentially help you, you know, um, develop your uh, weaknesses into strength. And once you've done that, at some stage, what you do is you say that, okay, I'm ready. I've, I've made improvements in my speaking. I can now participate in debates. I can you know, openly speak and, you know, participate in a discussion, put my viewpoints forward. At some stage, what you do is you decide, okay, now that I think I have achieved this, I want to now look at, um, you know, do a bit of doing an event, you know, checking that I can, can I do this or not? So you maybe get into a competition or at your school or your uni, you get into, uh, you know, a debate and you participate and you see if this actual change has happened or not. So or even on a personal level, Sometimes you will see that you go through this planning process, and this planning process is very similar, uh, you know, from a uh, from from what we've discussed for human resources planning, and it is a five six step process which allows you to identify, uh, you know, um, then look at, uh, you know, forecasting, completing, executing, and then reviewing to see how you will make this successful. Now. Going further, what we need to do is we need to understand two important processes within HR when we look at human resources planning. Now, one of the key functions, we looked at five or six key functions within HR yesterday. So it was staffing, it was reviews, it was looking at you know uh, recruitment, selection, perks and benefits. So when we look at these five main functions, training and development included, these were five, we look at concentrating on learning outcome two on two functions in particular. And these two functions are recruitment and selection. Now, why is recruitment important? And how is, uh, you know, when you, when you identify that you need to recruit resources, how do you look at doing the process of recruitment? And once you've recruited, how do you select and then bring those resources within the organization? So before we get into that, let's understand very briefly the definition of recruitment and definition of selection. Now, recruitment 
is defined as a process of searching and a potential pool of potential, you know candidates which have the knowledge skills and experience to work within the organization and the and basically fill vacancies which will allow organization to achieve objectives so it's a very clear process and a very clear definition you want to be able to identify and recruit the right person or the right talent into the organization which has the skills knowledge and prior experience and will help fill those vacancies and help achieve the organization of get the get to the goals or achieve the objectives now selection as a process is defined as you know you, once you have placed an advert a job advert you've got a number of responses you receive those number of responses what you need to be able to do is from that shortlist select you know the right uh, candidates to be able to join the organization or that particular role and that particular role would then be uh, you know filled by a person who is able to do value addition contribute and then take the organization forward so the process of selection is strategically planned it's a it's a very clearly defined procedure or a process within the organization which is depicted in the human resources uh, you know policies or handbook of an organization and that is where uh, you know it is clearly documented that how will you hire an employee how will you fire an employee to a certain extent what are the key criteria which the new uh, incumbent or employee will need to meet to be able to join the organization so selection is a process of understanding uh, that approach so that you are able to recruit uh, once you place the recruitment you are able to evaluate and then hire the right set of uh, right employee or the right person for the right job so that it can when they are in in that particular position able to take that forward and help achieve the organizational objective now in order to understand this process of recruitment and selection what we are going to do is we are going to look at a particular organization and i i have from a context picked up tesco which is one of the large uh, you know grocery as well as a large retailer in in the country they employ over I think 210,000 people in terms of workforce, and it has operation in 14 different countries. Now, using this example, what we are going to do is we are going to understand the recruitment and selection techniques which Tesco applies in this process to bring in talent or new employees into the organization. And this is important is because it will go, it will take us through that five stick step process that we have discussed in terms of human resources planning, which HR managers. have to put in place um and then sometimes they apply hard hrm approach and sometimes they apply soft hrm approach to recruit employees or recruit resources for a particular vacancy within the organization now it is quite clear uh, to say that different organizations have different processes of recruitment and selection that means no one company will have a same process of how it recruits people as compared to any other uh, other organization in the same sector now because everyone wants to attract the best talent and they want to recruit the best resources they have developed over the years processes which are very relevant to their own organization and these processes then uh, look at clearly identifying the skills knowledge and experience needed to fill a particular role or fill a particular vacancy in the organization now keeping an example of tesco in mind let's understand how the recruitment and selection process works and what are the techniques or what they apply now first thing first is when you look at tesco it's a retailer it has probably more than 2000 stores in the uk and if i look at globally i think in excess of 6000 stores across the 14 countries in which it operates now when they have a vacancy which comes in the vacancy is clearly identified in which department it is in which section which pay grade and you know what is the vacancy for in terms of the role so first for first and foremost in the recruitment and selection process you need to look at identification of vacancy where is the role required where is the new employee required or what is the area or role which the employee is going to come in and fill the second part would be to look at development of position description that means in short a job description 
Now, if the vacancy is being created for the first time, the HR manager will have to work with the line manager, department manager, or whatever, uh, you know, in, in terms of maybe where the vacancy is coming, the responsible management person to be able to create a job description. Now, assuming if Tesco is looking for a CEO or a chief executive officer, then the job description will not just be decided by the HR manager, but they will need to create an initial template that will go across to the board, the current board members, maybe to some key people outside the organization which sit on the board, and that is where the job description or uh, you know the position description will be finalized. But if it is a, a job vacancy which they're trying to fill, which is in one of the stores, and this is because of one of the person has left the organization, then it could be that this job description is already in place. And for that reason, they might just need to update that particular job description. So for example, in the stores, when you look at retail stores, a lot of people work in the tills, they work in the uh, shop floor department, the IT, this uh, you know telecoms department, grocery department, things like that. Now, if one of the person ends up leaving, it does not mean that the job description needs to be created. In some cases, the description is there but they might update that description uh, in terms of the job role with the changing environment, the changing job role over the years. And once created, the revision is primarily done uh, as and when a vacancy arises. Now, once you have that job description, you know where the vacancy is, the HR department might then put a recruitment plan in place. Recruitment plan would be, how would you recruit the person? whether it will be an internal recruitment, whether it will be external recruitment, will you recruit through externally by an agency? Would you place an advert? That whole plan is primarily, or the whole process will be primarily the recruitment process. And in this case, when we look at the recruitment process, it could involve, say, for example, advertising, you know, advertising the vacancy or the role. Once the responses to the adverts have come in, it will involve some sort of screening, and once the screening has been done, you've made a short list in terms of the number of CVs or the number of candidates which are uh, you know, shortlisted for that role. You will then start the process of interview. And the interviews could be in some companies, you have one round of interview, you have second round in some companies, you have even three. Depending on the seniority of the role or the person who is joining the role at what level, you might have the interview and selection process to be that complex. So if a CEO is being recruited, you will see that the the person or the the the, uh, the the shortlist is created from appropriate candidates which have the skill, the knowledge, the industry experience, and they are already working or have worked at least with uh, a number of similar positions in the past with other organizations. But if it's uh, you know a person being interviewed uh, for a store manager role then in those cases, what they will do is they will have a smaller process of interviewing or screening. And that would mean that you will probably end up meeting the branch manager, the regional manager, and he or she will be able to then take a decision of which candidate is to be hired. The CEO might not be required to look at doing the interviews for a, for a store manager. So they go through this process of, you know, uh, identification of vacancy. Uh, then look at job description. If it's not in existence, if it's there, then update it. And then look at a recruitment plan, internal or external. Advertisement is placed, recruitment, uh, shortlist is created, screening is done. Once you have shortlisted candidates, you do interviews, one round, second round. In Tesco, normally there are two rounds. And once the interviews have happened, what will happen is they will then give the job to the successful in interview uh, interviewee. And that would mean that you will receive an offer letter or a contract, uh, and then you'll be asked to join on a certain particular date. Is that okay? Yeah. So that explains that five or six step process of, you know, human resource planning. When we go through the, you know, process of understanding first the gap areas, uh, you know, then looking at determination of gap, then looking at, you know, the uh, job position or job description, and then looking at uh, finally the process of selection. And the once the selection has done, the person has joined uh, and the person has perform started performing. After a year, you do the appraisals monitoring to be able to see if the person is able to achieve and you know uh, contribute to that job role.
So this is how the process of you know recruitment and selection would work in a company like Tesco. But generally, most companies would follow similar five or six step process through which they bring people in to the vacant uh, you know uh, to the vacant role, the fill the vacant role, or bring somebody in into the organization through the process of recruitment and selection. Now, any questions on this so far? No. Okay, Daniel, any questions at your end? Uh, sir, I just want to ask, like, uh, what is line manager? So when you, uh, when you look at working within an organization, depending on the structure, typically what happens is there are different terminologies which you get to see used in the organization. Sometimes um, you will see when you work within a particular department, and you report into a, a, a department head, that person might be, will be called your line manager, somebody who is involved in your appraisals, somebody who looks at directly managing you, monitoring you, is the person which is called a line manager. This terminology that you asked me a question comes into play when you see that large organizations like say, let's look at a company which is present across different countries, and you work within a particular department. So. The other day I picked up an example of uh, Samsung. Uh, today probably I'll look at an example of Tesco, uh, keeping in mind. Now Tesco has operation in 14 countries. You will see that the top management structure, you know, like the country head of an organization, typically will report into the CEO of an organization. So Tesco's headquarters is based in the UK. So all the 14 regional offices or the uh, countries which have operation, they all, their heads, the country is actually all report into the CEO in, in the UK. Sometimes you will see that uh, what will happen is because the revenue being generated by certain regional offices is so big that what they do is they put a structure between the CEO and the country head and that person might be managing some side of operation. So there'll be vice president of Western Europe, vice president of Eastern Europe and Middle East or vice president of Southeast Asia. That person might have two or three regional operations, uh, country head reporting into him. And that person then reports into the CEO. So for you, your immediate person who's going to manage you, manage your appraisals is called the line manager. But the country head might also directly report into the CEO for certain approvals or budgeting and other things. And that is where functional manager is also a term which is sometimes used. So sometimes you administratively report or uh, you know um, uh, administratively report into the immediate person based on the same geography or country, but you sometimes functionally report into a, another person who is based in a different country. And that is where you will see that these terms like line immediate uh, or my reporting manager or my functional manager as a term comes into play within organizations. Is that okay? Yes. So a clear example that I would say if that's not okay, then would be if you look at Microsoft as a company, they are organized as product, uh, you know, on the basis of products. So you see the Xbox business head, you see the Windows business head, you see uh, you know, the mobile business head. Now, they are organized on the basis of products. So Google, for example, is also organized on the basis of products. So the search business is business. You see advertising as another side of the business, which is then you see Google Chrome as one side of the business. So here you will see a lot of engineers and a lot of people working within different countries work within the product segment. And here they work administratively and report to a administrative head within the country, but they will also report functionally into the product head for the particular uh, product they're working on. An example, you have an Xbox product manager in all countries. He or she looks after sales, you know, regionalization of the products, the games and everything, but they report into something called the group product manager, which is based in the US. So administratively, they report into something called the individual head of the organization within a geography country, but functionally they report into the head office and report into the product manager who's the group product manager for that product, which is Xbox. So line manager in this case would be, your line manager will be a group product manager. 
but your administrative manager or the person who's responsible for your reviews, your pay, your package, you know, your salary, your perks, and your annual appraisals will be the person based in that country. That will be your immediate boss, but your line manager would be because you are working on a productized function basis, would be your group product manager. Okay? Yeah. Good stuff. Any other question, Manur? No. Okay, Tanya, any questions from your side? Everything understood? Yes. Yeah? You're okay with it, Daniel? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what I'll do is, after this presentation um, and the session, I'm gonna email you the presentation and also a handout, which will cover learning outcome one and learning outcome two. So the idea would be you go through the handouts to understand the theoretical concept of soft and uh, uh, hard in HRM, and then you understand the process of recruitment and planning and how recruitment planning is done within an organization. And that will help you address, you know, these three tasks which are in learning outcome two. Okay? Yeah. Okay, good stuff. So I will catch up with you uh, in the next session. And the next session for this uh, unit is, is it going to be next weekend? No, it's going to be on 16. On 16, okay, that's fine. Yeah, no, but I, I cannot attend because of the timing. So I've kept it for 3 p.m. Um, and I think it will be about 11 p.m. in Korea. Yeah, so in it will be five here and we have Ramadan starting. All right, okay. So on that day, what I will do, Manur, is if we if, when we do the session, we will send you a copy of the recording okay. for you to go through. And then what we can do is in the subsequent session that we do, if you have any questions, we'll recap uh, before we start. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No worries. Okay. Thank you so much for joining, uh, Daniel. You have a good night because I think it's almost midnight for you. And uh, Manur, at your end. I would say you enjoy the rest of your evening and I'll catch up with you on 16th. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And bye.